All right, that's our theme verse of the year, Deuteronomy 12, 28. And then anybody remember the theme verse for the series that we've been doing, the Shape series? Anybody remember what it is? I know I kind of quick question. Do you remember? Oh, wait, what was the question? <laughs> okay, we're doing the series on shape. This is going to be the third week. Oh, never mind then. I wasn't here for the start. Yeah, you weren't here for that the start. Anybody remember what it is, the, the verse that we've been, we were talking about for our shape series? You know what? I'm going to say... I don't know if I remember, Ephesians 2.10, and I might, have, I might have seen a little bit of that. I think it's Ephesians 2.10. For we are all, we are God's masterpiece created in Christ to do good works. Something like that, I didn't remember it. For we are God's masterpiece, He has created us anyway in Christ Jesus, so that we can do the good things He planned for us to do long ago. In other words, we all have been created with a special purpose. We've been created uniquely, and there's a lot of unique things about us. Um, to do uh, to accomplish a special purpose in the kingdom of heaven. Now, um, question for you from last week. Anybody remember what the first thing we started? The first week was just an intro. Intro. The second week we started with the acronym. I think it's called right an acronym. S H A P E. All right, and we started with S. Lighthouse last week was brought to you by the letter S. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right, and the number. I don't know, 210, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> Numbers 210, okay. So, last week, Lighthouse was brought to you by the letter S. This week, it's going to be brought by H. But anybody remember what S stood for last week? Spiritual, spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts. You were going to say the same thing, spiritual gifts. Okay, and last week, I sent home a little uh, a test for you on spiritual gifts. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. This is summer, right? And it's like, what am I doing giving tests? Well, fortunately, um, it wasn't a required test. It was, it was more of a, it was a fun test, guys. It was supposed to be for fun. See, I could have said that home. Then when I asked, would you guys do any fun thing this week? You could have said, I took the spiritual gifts test. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sweet. Okay, so did anybody take the test home and complete it and bring it back? Sean is in the back, Melissa's in the front, and Kate, you did it? I didn't finish adding up all the stuff, but I... We finished it. Okay. Well, what we're going to get into then tonight is going to be the letter H. And I'll explain that in just a minute, but let's bow our head let's pray before we get started. Here. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to be here. I thank you for the young people that are here tonight, and some of us that are a little bit older. I thank you that for all of us, you have a purpose and a plan and a specific shape certain way that you've created us to be to make a difference in our world for your kingdom. And Father, we just ask that you're here tonight and you open our eyes to new truth so we, that we can understand what our calling is, what our purpose is, and how we can better serve you and the people around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Okay, I've got a one-pager tonight. I was pretty impressed. I got all my notes on the one page. Usually it's, it's spilling over onto the second page. Sometimes three pages, but that's ridiculous. Gonna never get to everything then. So I'm gonna try to keep it much more simpler. So I've got a one page for you tonight. We're gonna discuss um, H, which stands for heart. How many of you in here have a heart? My <laughs> Oh yeah. How many of you have ever seen your heart? You've seen your heart, really? Ultrasound. Ultrasound, really? And uh, I don't know. Do you guys watch a beat on that? Is it, do you have a Do you have a pretty regular heartbeat, or is it a pretty regular? It's good. It's good. Yeah. You don't want to have any regular heartbeat. I hear that's not good for you. So. All right. So we've got one person that's actually seen their heart. So how do the rest of you know you have a heart? Oh, you can feel it. Oh, you can feel it. Okay. All right. Good. Well, good. Good. Good to know. I suppose the fact that you're here is, is probably one indication that your heart's working as well. Okay. So heart. Basically what the heart is, and what we're going to be talking about tonight, is to discover your true passion. So, I'll be we'll probably using words, I actually will probably use the word passion a little more than heart. I think they just chose the word heart because it lines up with H, because S-P-A-P-E would be a really weird word. <laughs> you know, and it wouldn't, just probably wouldn't be that catchy. Hey, have you ever heard of that, heard of that book, Spape? It's really good. Yeah, you can find out your Spape for life. God's, you know God's created with you, you and the unique Spape? Yeah, he's like, ah, you know what? probably need to switch passion out there give it. It's like, oh, we'll call it heart. So I'm probably going to be using the word passion. When I say that, it, li it lines up with the word heart, which lines up with the letter H, which is the letter that brought you lighthouse tonight. So, if we were all from, uh, you know, I should have dressed like a big yellow bird for our special, for our meeting. <laughs> Perfect. I'm sure you all would love that. Okay. 
<laughs> Before we get us started, I'm going to throw out a verse for you, something to ponder. If you guys have, uh, have been in uh, Lighthouse for a while, you've definitely heard me talk about this verse before. I'm just going to throw it out there for you, and then the last thing, I'm going to come back to the verse for the last thing and wrap it up and, and apply the verse to our lesson. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And like I said, we're going to be substituting the word passion for heart. And I really believe what, what this verse is talking about, when it talks about your heart, it's not really talking about that thing that's beating inside of you that Nathaniel has seen and the rest of us have felt of ours. Now, you do want to guard your heart. Your heart is very important. Without a heart, you cannot live. So, um, but it's like that, what you're passionate about, where your heart is, what, what this verse is talking about, when it says your heart, it means what you're passionate about. Guard the things that you are passionate about. Because the things that you are passionate about, Lexi, will determine the course of your life. If you're passionate about good things, it will lead to a good life. If you're passionate about bad things, it will lead to a bad life. If you're passionate about eternal things, it will lead to what? Eternal life. Yes. Pretty cool, huh? We probably want to be passionate about eternal things. That'd be cool. If we want to live forever. All right. So now, I, I read this quote in this book, Shape, which, where is my book, Shape? Does anybody have their book, Shape, on? Do you have the book, Shape? I need that book, Shape, actually. In the book, Shape, I think I have mine in my backpack. In the book, Shape, there was a quote in there that said, the core problem with most people is not that we are too passionate about bad things, so I would look at, you know, I think most of you are pretty, pretty solid people. I'm guessing you're not really passionate about, like, slaying people with, with guns in movie theaters. What just happened there? Oh, it's a Mac problem. Oh, you're right. It's not, it's not a PC. That was really fun. It's not a PC, that's right. It was behaving on a PC a little bit earlier this week. Anyway, um, the core problem is that I doubt that you guys are really passionate about, like, evil things. Like, you don't just sit at home planning out these diabolical things of how you can go and, and cause corruption in a city, you know, and wage war on a, on a good guy dressed like a bat. I doubt any of you are like that. <laughs> anybody see uh, God, The Dark Knight Rises? This, did anybody dis... Yes, I did. On, I think we have Monday night. Monday, Monday night. Did anybody dislike The Dark Knight Rises? Okay. I know. I know. There were actually some people online that gave a negative review. Was, I know. Well, they're crazy. You know, that's what, <laughs> not something pay critics do. That. Anyway, no, it was a pretty, pretty exciting movie. Anyway, I doubt any of you were like wandering in sewers with, with a, a, a wearing a mask that makes your voice all really weird. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so it's not that you're passionate about bad things, but the problem is, this guy says with most of us, and I think he's referring to people in the church, is that we're not passionate enough about good things. It's like sometimes when it comes to really good things, it's like, oh, yeah, God, he's so good. You know, it's like we really should be passionate more, but sometimes like, yeah, telling people about Jesus, that's not a great idea, why don't you guys go do that? I'll meet you up with the ice cream later, you know what I'm saying? You know, worship, yeah, let's do that for about two minutes, and then let's move on to something else more fun. Sometimes I think in life we're just not passionate enough about good things, and that's where our heart comes in. We need to discover what are we passionate about, and am I passionate about the right things? Okay. And why do we want to be passionate about the right things? Because our heart does what for us, as Proverbs said? Determines the course of our life. All right. Sweet. Okay, I'm going to read you a story about a lady named Kay Warren. Anybody in here ever heard of Rick Warren? Yes. All right. Some people like him. Some people don't. He's a pastor of a huge church in, I believe, California, Saddleback. Um, Saddleback Community Church or something. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, he's written a number of books, The Purpose Driven Life. Anybody written The Purpose Driven Life? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a pretty good, pretty good book. Um, anyway, his wife, there's a story of his wife in here, and I'm on the wrong chapter. Um, Kay, and it just kind of shares an awakening she had to what she was passionate about. It says, Kay Warren was living the dream. She had three great kids. Two wonderful grandkids in a comfortable home in Southern California's upscale Orange County. The daughter of a pastor, she and her husband Rick had co-founded one of the largest congregations in the United States. 
He had written a, mo a million um, copy best-selling book, and that was The Purpose Driven Life. And she was a Bible teacher, a popular speaker, a co-author of a curriculum that teaches the essential truths of Christian life, of Christian faith. And she was, in her own words, the stereotypical white suburban soccer mom. So she accomplished a lot of things. But apparently there was something missing. Let's read on. That all came crashing down in 2002. Thumbing through a magazine at home, she turned a page and froze at the horror of photos of African people ravaged by AIDS. Children and adults with skeletal bodies whose eyes were covered in flies because they were too weak to brush them away. A box on the page said 12 million children orphaned in Africa due to AIDS. That was a shocking statistic to me because I didn't know how a single or I didn't know a single orphan, and I couldn't believe there were 12 million orphans anywhere due to anything. Kay said. When a month had passed and the images still haunted her, Kay realized that she had come to the crossroads. She could either return to her comfortable life, or hear the cries of the suffering and let their heart and let her heart be engaged. I made a conscious decision to open my heart to the pain, she said. When I did, God broke my heart. He shattered it in a million pieces, and I cried for days. She cried in the shame because the AIDS, pan AIDS pandemic had been building for two decades, and she'd done nothing. She also cried because God allowed her to feel the suffering those, AIDS, those with AIDS felt. I had no agenda. I wasn't thinking about anyone else's response to my own, she said. I knew I couldn't stand before God. When he called me home and looked him in the eyes and look him in the face and tell him, yes, I knew about the suffering of millions of people, but I did nothing about it. She knew that obeying God would be hard. Other people, out of ignorance and fear, would reject her passion. She was afraid of contracting the disease and being uh, seen or, or being seen as weak on moral issues. But the Lord told her, if you ask, if you ask my life, if that is what you ask me to bring awareness, I will give it. That is what I require, a willingness to give at any cost. And that's all I want to read that. Thank you very much for letting me go to part of the book. So, what we have here was Kay had all this. A perfect life, some would say. She had a lot of money. Um, Pastoring one of the largest churches, they had a lot of money. Now, I'm sure they were good people. I'm sure they didn't spend their night, waste their money on a lot of things that a lot of rich people do. She had great kids, great family. Great, a great husband who was a pastor of a great church, but there was something that all of a sudden struck a chord in her heart and started tugging at her. And, she, that, and that's where she had an opportunity. She could push that aside and continue to live in comfort or open up and start to feel the pain some other people were feeling. And that's where your heart comes in. Um, uh, there's another quote in that book that says, God wants your heart only beat for him. And the, war, the battle we face in life is, are we going to let our hearts get attached to the things around us, the things that are easy, the things we like, or are we going to allow our hearts to be passionate about the things that God is passionate about? This is the question that Kay is facing, and I'm going to propose to you tonight, this is a question all of us have to face. Because the world is going to try to pull us in many different directions. God wants to be, wants us to be only after the things that he's after. Now where your heart is centered in life is going to indicate where you will serve. And here's some questions you can ask yourself. What drives you in life? These are some good questions. And if you are taking notes, maybe there's some things to write, to write down. What is it that drives you in life? Like, what really motivates you? Are you motivated by money? There's some people, it's like, you know what? They don't like to get out of bed. They won't put their video games down, except when it's time to go to work, because they love that paycheck. How many of you like payday? It's, it's okay to like payday. Some people, it's okay to like payday, payday, but some people, they love, that is the thing that motivates them. Some people, the thing that motivates them is ice cream. They don't get excited for anything. You can't get them to come out to, on Wednesday night for anything. But if you're going to Dairyland or Dairy Queen, they are there leading the way. 
Some people's ice cream. Other people, things we mentioned might, it might be sports. All they can talk about, all they think, what drives you? Some people, you know, they might not be interested in helping other people, but when, it's, when it comes to playing sports for their school, they're there at every practice, they're playing hard, they're tough, they're competitive, it might be sports. The question is, what drives you in life? What is your strongest motivation? Hopefully, that becomes serving the Lord. That's what we want to get to. But sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves, step back, you know what? When it comes to serving the Lord, I might, maybe I'm not as driven, driven as I am to do other things. And that's where a process of breaking ourselves, allowing God to change us, humbling ourselves comes in. Okay, second thing, what do you care about? Probably sum that up a little bit, but what is it that you truly care about, like you'll be concerned over? It might be your family members. Some people, um, which is a good thing, maybe it's like, you know, a lot of times you don't show a lot of interest in other people, but when somebody's like maybe hurting your sister or saying something bad about your brother or your parents, it's like, bam, you are step up and you are passionate about that and you're in their face, you shut up, all that type of thing. You know, that's a good thing. You know, it, it's, not, it's not wrong to be passionate about your family. But what are the things that you care about? What do you find yourself, or maybe, maybe when it's you, maybe I know, I know Nathan, one of the things, because I've known him for a while, he cares very strongly about the country that he's from, Thailand. One thing. You know, other countries, I'm sure, you know, I, I'm sure he's, he's, he's a great guy that, uh, you know, he has nothing against countries like England or Ireland or Africa, but when you talk about Thailand, it's a whole different thing. He cares about that country. So what are the things you care about? These are going to help start revealing where your heart is. What needs do you desire to meet? If you ever just like, um, uh, maybe you've, uh, um, maybe it's been watching the news, maybe it's hearing about certain people, or maybe, uh, maybe it's like, you know what, oh, I really wish I could help those people. I really wish I could meet that need. There's some people, like they have, a, they have, they have money, maybe they don't even have a lot of money, but if they know that somebody else needs money, they're just like, they'll, they'll get out and whatever they got, they got five bucks, 10 bucks, they'll give it to them. What are, they, what are some needs that you really want to see met in this life? Um, Jenna Maxwell is one. I know one thing uh, she's always expressed a passion about, um, just since she was a young age, she hates seeing women being treated unjustly. And what she, you know, like uh, countries, um, uh, a lot of Muslim nations, uh, Afghanistan is one in particular that she's talked about, that women have to cover themselves completely except for their eyes when they're out in public because it's just a shame issue, just basically women are treated like property and that has always got her irritated. She wants to see the need, these, we, needs of these women met so to someone to tell them they have value. It's a need she's always been stirred to meet. So what are some needs that, that um, you desire to meet? Um, what cause do you desire to conquer? And actually, I'm going to hand out um, a page here, and um, I'm going to explain causes in just a minute, so I'll skip that for now. And then what is your dream for God's kingdom? For me, a while back, I just, I had this dream when I got, when I'd interact with uh, young people. It was like, you know what? I really wish somebody was in their life inspiring them to live for the Lord. Like I said, you know, adults, I'd hang out, I'd be around them, okay, nothing big, no big deal, no, no real tug in my heart, but when I was around teenagers, like somebody, this person needs someone in their life inspiring them to live for the Lord, and that's when I realized that my dream for God's kingdom is to see young people grow up and know the Lord, like I had to be, what my dad was for me, I wanted to be that for other people, so that was kind of my dream. Okay, now it is easy, I want to tell you this, I want to give you this little word of warning, uh, I don't think I was that it's easy, very easy, to get caught up in our own lives, caring little for the needs of others. And we'll often ask questions like, how does this purpose benefit me? And you notice in that story of Kay, when she started seeing her, her, um, this, this hurt that these people were going through, one of the first things she said she asked herself is, how is it going to benefit me to get involved in this? We've got to get past that at people. Sometimes helping others isn't really going to be a huge benefit to us. And that's one time, one thing when it comes up, when Mission FF comes up every year, sometimes it's difficult to inspire people to want to be a part of it because we'll step back and we'll look, ah, uh, and I'll hear this, well, I, I, every once in a while it happens, I'll be talking to a youth and um, say, hey, well, you're going to go on uh, Mission FF this, this year. And I know some people can't, and that's great because they have conflicting things. You know, it's a week out of the summer. It's difficult. But then sometimes there's people like, well, I don't know. It wasn't all that fun last year. And I'm thinking, you know, well, I can understand if it wasn't fun why you wouldn't want to go again. But fun was not the point. Mission FF isn't about what benefits me. 
It's about what can we do for others. And we've got to be careful that we don't ask those questions because, you know, sometimes it's going to come up in life. Like, so you're going to have, I bet this is going to happen to you. I bet it's going to happen to all of you. There's going to come a day in your life where you're ready to go off to college and maybe, like, because of the shape series we've done, God's put a few things on your heart that you, like, know that, when you're, that, you're, that, you, that you're called to and you want to be a part of. But as you get to college, you might find yourself being drawn towards a different type of career. Wow, if I pursue this career, I could, like, um, make a lot of money over here. And you're going to start to see it. But that kind of starts pulling me away from the things I know God's calling me. And we're going to, you all at some point probably have to make a choice. Am I going to pursue this one, which is going to benefit me? Or will I pursue this one that's going to benefit others and it's going to help advance the kingdom? Now, sometimes God brings them both together. You'll get a degree that you're really passionate about and it, it's, it, it, uh, it's part of this plan. But other times there has to be the choice where you've got to leave something behind to choose something else. And we keep, we've got to be careful that we're not going to ask, what benefits me? We've got to ask, is this going to benefit the kingdom of heaven? Sometimes that's a tough question to ask for us. All right. Um, now, just an indication here. I'm going to pass these around here. Why don't you take them? Just take them face down. It's not a big deal. But just don't be distracted by them at this moment. Um, the question to ask yourself, we're going to flip this over. This page is talking about causes, a cause to be involved in. And um, uh, um, what this is, is this is something that like is, is, is it's part of you that you just have a, draw, have a drawing uh, you, drawing inside you to, to uh, make a change about something. And I'm going to give you an example of this. D.L. Moody, he was an old, um, back in, I think, the early 1900s. Um, before he became, he became a really famous uh, minister. And uh, before he did this, he, uh, this is how he knew that, that, that his calling was to be an evangelist to lost people. Was, uh, he, was, he was a businessman, and uh, he was sharing with a few of his businessmen friends. They were Christians as well. He was sharing in this, this call. He felt God was calling him to ministry. And his, his friend said to him, how do you know God's calling you to ministry? He said, this is how I knew God was calling me to ministry. I'd open the window. They were up in a business room. And it overlooked this park. I don't know if it was in New York or Chicago or something. It overlooks this park. And uh, um, he, he says to his friends, he said, what do you see out there? And he said, well, we see a park. Okay. He said, well, what else do you see in the park? Well, there's people walking around in the park. He says, that's what you see is people in the park. When I look out there, I see lost souls going to hell, and I need to do something about it. And that was basically the cause he knew. It was his heart crying out. It was, he was a natural drawing. You saw people in the park. He saw people going to hell. He needed to do something about it. You can flip those pages over. This is a list of a lot of different causes in life that people can get involved in. Um, different injustices to, 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 um, to be active in, uh, to bring to an end. So what I'm going to have you do, I'm going to have you take a minute or so and read them over. Mark, well, any of those that you are really passionate about, but maybe mark you know, one or two or three maybe that you know are causes that really stick out to you. Something that you when you read through this, this is the one that stick out to you. And the cool thing about this is we go back and we share these causes. We're going to find out that we all probably had a different one or two at the top of our list. Okay? I would suggest for you, hang on to this thing. You know, it's a, it's a little thing, but um, if, if any of you made a destiny box or have a, a yeah. journal. Yeah. A destiny <laughs> box, that's right. This might be one of those things you just fold up and just put in there because down the road, every once in a while, it's just good to open those things up and just take a look and just see the things that God's been stirring in your life over the years. And you know what? Ten years from now, you might pull this sheet out and you'll find that what you're doing in life is exactly lining up to some of the things that God had started doing in your life ten years ago. So I would just suggest to keep it. Um, and if you have, obviously, if you have a notebook that you're using for here, um, you can keep it for this, this shape um, workbook that we're going through. So, um... Anyway, anybody surprised by any of those things that, that, that were on the list that, that, you, that you marked? Or were they, have you known about these things for a while that you're passionate about them? Have you known this for a while, most of you? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Cool. Well, another thing, just is, it's one more step along the way kind of confirming what God is doing in your lives. Okay. So, um, probably, let's see here. Now, when we, we uh, start dealing with, I just have a few thoughts before I wrap things up. How many of you, though, when you think about, like, the size of these issues that you're dealing with, how many of you kind of feel like, 
what can I really do to make a difference in all of this? I mean, anybody honestly say, I'd love to make a difference, but it's like, what can I do about all this? Some of us, maybe you, maybe you feel confident you can, which is great. But even for me, you know, it's like, I know there are thousands of teens in the U.S. that don't know about the Lord. In the, light, in the big picture, there's a very little difference I can make. But you know what? I can with some, so I'm going to do it. And we have to be able to trust that God's going to take what we do, and he's going to use it, and he's going to make us effective. He would not have put these desires in your heart if he didn't have a plan to fulfill them, if he didn't have a plan to use you to make a difference in these issues. So be confident of that. Ethan, these things that, that stuck out to you, Nathan, Lexi, all of you, these things that God's put in your heart, even if it seems like this huge task ahead of you, he would not put those desires in your heart if he didn't have a plan to use you to make a difference. So take confidence in that. You know what? Fine. If this is what God says that, I, that I'm going to make a difference in, I'm just going to keep doing what I can do and trust that God's going to make a difference. Okay. A couple more thoughts here. There's a quote by one of my favorite um, authors. His name is John Eldridge. He says, don't ask yourself how. Because sometimes it's like, God, how can I make a difference here? He says, don't ask how. How, we just did that. Mm -hmm. How is never the right question, okay? Never. Don't ever ask yourself, how can I make a difference? It's not the right question. Ask a different question. And I'll tell you what the question is in just a minute. <sighs> <laughs> Supper. Supper. All right. How is never the right question. How is a faithless question. That's what John Elvin says anyway. How is God's department. What God is asking you is what? What is written on your heart? And we're beginning to discover these things. Some of these things just came out a few minutes ago for us. Some of these things we've already known. What is written on your heart? What makes you come alive? Because there's, you know, maybe in, in, in life you're not passionate about anything, but all of a sudden you maybe hear some stories about some at-risk children, or, 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 or maybe in an abortion clinic where, where um, you hear a story of, of, of a few young people that have been encouraged to have abortion and then went and did it, and all of a sudden you're just like, I love them. No, somebody needs to intervene. Somebody needs to tell them that's not the way. Somebody needs to tell that there's a better way than that. Somebody needs to make a difference in these kids' lives. All of a sudden, you're starting to come alive. John says, John Eldridge here is saying, find out what it is that makes you come alive. Don't worry about how to do it. Find out what it is. If you could do what you always wanted to do, what would it be? What God's written in your heart, God will bring it to pass. Don't be afraid to ask this question. Don't be afraid to search your heart and find out what you're passionate about, the passions that God's placed within you. Now, the last thing I want to do here before I wrap this up is I want to discuss um, what I call passion myths. This actually wasn't in the book, but I really wanted to bring this up because sometimes um, I think there's a few things that we assume about our passions or assume about our callings that we get wrong, and I just wanted to touch on these real briefly before we end it here. All of this, this stuff about passion we've talked about, things we can go, these causes we can go make a difference, it's all easier said than done. Staying passionate about the right things is sometimes a difficult struggle. Sometimes we can have a lot of passion, but maintaining that passion, staying on the right course, um, to, uh, uh, working through difficulties and, and, and it can be a difficult thing. And I want to just debunk a few myths here about, about your passion so that you don't buy into these things along the way. And these things are good to, to make note of. Uh, write down if you're taking notes. I, I just encourage you, these things are good. Um, first thing is, oh, are these all going to come up and it's not? I thought I, all right, well, ignore them for now. First one, just focus on the first one here. If you're truly passionate about something, the feelings of passion will always be there. I want you guys to know this. Sometimes God will call you to something. And you'll be excited. God's going to work through me. I'm not going to ask how. I just ask what. And now I know what. And God's going to His Spirit's in me. We're going to make a difference because He said He would. He wouldn't have put these desires in my heart if He didn't plan to complete them. And we're excited to get on the journey. And all of a sudden, over time, maybe a little bit, it gets difficult. Days get long, you're maybe serving some at-risk children, and you're 
helping them, and you've, you've developed a program, and you've got a, this, this uh, place where they can come and hang out and get some good counseling, play some games, get some good teaching, have fun socializing, but they're not responding. They're, not, they're still getting involved in the drugs. Like that was their, their risk. They were at risk that some of them are still committing crimes and going to prison. And it's like you feel like there's no fruit in what you're doing. And all of a sudden, you start to think, yeah, you know what, this just isn't fun anymore. I don't feel very passionate about it. Maybe this isn't what I'm called to. I just want to warn you, you won't always feel passionate about the things you're passionate about. Sometimes your feelings come, sometimes they go. Even me, as much as I love you guys, there are days when it's like, Lighthouse, and eh, if I could just call everyone tonight and, uh, Maybe they can just replay the video from last week, and I can just skip it tonight. You know, we can't do that yet. That's right. Some days it's just like, you know what? I'd rather just go hang out and eat some ice cream. You know, I feel more passionate. Maybe God's changed my passion to ice cream. You know, and then there's days I've said, you know what? This is just a phase you're going through. You need to stay on course. So your feelings of passion won't always be there. Second thing is, if you are naturally good at it. I'm sorry, no, not if. You are naturally good at what you are passionate about, and you won't have to work on getting better at it. Is that a question? Yeah, yeah. what's up? Well, like, what if people are passionate about the Okay, which, regarding? What if you're passionate about wrong things? Yeah. Um, well, that's going to tie in probably to our last uh, verse um, uh, in Proverbs. I'm going to come back to that. But that's another question. Sometimes our passion are the wrong things. Um, yeah, or you could be naturally good at something, but that may not be what God's called you to. It may be something you need to lay down. Like this one, um, you're naturally good at what you're passionate about. You want to work, work on it. Um, you might be, you might be passionate about something that isn't good, and that's where we have to bring that to God and say, God, I can't be involved in this. And that's where we need to spend time with God. That's where we need to, as that song goes, um, Hosanna, break my heart for what breaks yours. That might be a time when, if you know you're involved in something that God isn't, doesn't enjoy and He definitely is involved in, that might be time to get before God. God, I give this to you. My heart is attached to something it shouldn't be. I need you to change it. And we have to lay that at His feet. And that's when we pray something like, God, make me passionate about what you're passionate about. It does happen, though. I've had to struggle with it. There are things in life that I am sometimes drawn to enjoy that I know I shouldn't be enjoying. That type of deal. And we to, it's, that's a lifelong process. So great question. Great question. Okay, the second one. You are naturally good at what you're passionate about, and you won't have to work on getting better at it. You know what? God may call you to be a public speaker, but you may not be a great public speaker. But if it's written in your heart, start working on it. It's plain and simple as that. We're not always going to be great Things. You know what? Uh, working with elderly, elderly, there was probably a day when Tori probably, if somebody had said, hey, you're going to work with elderly someday, she would have said, I'm not very good at that. Would you have ever said that? No. You would have. <laughs> but she's worked at it. All of a sudden, she's got passion about it. It's not always true. You're not always going to be naturally good at it. Maybe God calling you something, and he just wants you to trust that he's going to help you become good at it all the time. Okay. Uh, uh, third, figuring out what you're passionate about will be obvious to you. And you won't need anyone else's input. It's not true. Sometimes you may, you're going to have to sit down with, with somebody and say, hey, you know what, I've been thinking about this or this. What do you think? And somebody might say, hey, you know what, I just can't see you. It might be somebody you, you know and trust that has some wisdom. I can't see you doing this. I can see you doing this though. And you're going to say, eh, I don't know about that. But sometimes that's how I found out sometimes about me. It's just been, you know what, why don't you try this? And all of a sudden you try something new and it's like, whoa, I really like this. So sometimes you need other people's input. That's why we're going through this day, because uh, this um, these next few weeks. Because I know it's not just going to pop up and hit you in the face someday. Psh, psh, psh. Work with at-risk children. Psh, psh, psh. Work with those individual with with disabilities. Some people you might be lucky and it just hits you. Other people it might take some time. You know, actually they say the average college student, I think, switches majors. Uh, I won't even be able to remember this district, right? But it's like I think it's more than five times throughout the course of their. I don't remember how many times it is. Yeah. Because sometimes we just, it takes us trying a few different things so we find out what we're good at, what we're passionate about. Okay. Two or three or four, or whatever, just throw any number out there. 65, all right. Your passion will never change. I don't think that's true. 
I think there's times in life, there'll be certain stages in life you're passionate about. Right now, youth ministry is a passion of mine. But as I look into my future, I don't think I'm going to be doing it forever. Maybe for a few more years, maybe for a while, but I think God has some other things on the horizon for me. And um, actually, it was, it was prophesied over me, Ben Goodman, a number of years ago, that he saw me ministering to families in the future along with my wife. Cool thing that just happened tonight when we took this test, both you and I heard it, and it was not planned, that uh, my wife and I are both passionate about marriage and family issues. So, that might be a little confirmation that we had here tonight, that God is leading in a different, maybe, you know, it was still, maybe, it was, that family would include youth, so it, it just may be expanding, that passion may be expanding, changing a little bit. So it's not always going to be the same thing. Um, you know, God has different stages in our life. Um, fifth thing, I can count and use my fingers at the same time, I'm great. Fulfilling your passion is about you being happy. No! <laughs> your personal happiness and your fulfillment, that is a part of it. But it is not the biggest part of it. And I think, you know, what kind of what Lexi was even getting at? There will be times, like maybe when you're starting out, your, the thing that you know you're called to may not excite you a ton. And you may have to walk in it for a while before you really find out, yes, this is truly me and where God has me. Or it could be on the flip side. You may start out gung-ho like we talked about. But then you go through a phase of kind of questioning and all that. But as you continue to trust and follow and God changes you, you, you realize, yes, God does have me in the right place. You might be incredibly excited. You might not be. That's not the only factor to consider. There's a lot of others. So. But I will say this. You may not always be incredibly happy at every moment during, um, while, as you're um, fulfilling your passion, but over the long haul, I guarantee you this, nothing will fulfill you more in life. And you can write this down because this is a, an incredible quote. I don't have it on here. But nothing will fulfill you more in life than fulfilling the purpose God has for you. Again, not every moment of every way of every day is it going to be 100% happy, happy blissfulness. But in the long run, nothing will fulfill you more than fulfilling the purpose God has for you. Okay? And then finally, what I'm passionate about and what God is passionate about is the same thing. Hopefully, as I said that, both of you all said, that's obviously not. But sometimes, you'll get, this, you'll, you'll get well, you know, people say, well, if I, I just, I, I love doing this, or I mean, this, so obviously God's in it. Some of you have heard the story before. A while back, my dad, you know, was pastor of, of, this, of this church one time, and there was this, this couple that was married, and all of a sudden, the, the, the gentleman, the man in the relationship, uh, came to my dad and said, you know, uh, God's asking me to uh, divorce my wife and marry this other lady. Oh, really? You're pretty sure it's God? Yep, yep, I can tell, because I want to do this. Okay. Some of us might step back and say, you know what? I don't think that was God. He was convinced it was, because that's what he wanted to do. Not always are the things that we want to do in life the same things that God wants us to do. Again, I'll be getting back a little bit to what Lexi had alluded to. Sometimes we're passionate about the wrong things. We have to be honest about that. So Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else. My young people, don't let yourself get attached to and passionate about the wrong things because they determine the course of your life. If we're passionate about the things that God's put in our hearts, again, initially on, we may not be too excited about it, but it will lead us to a wonderful, God-fulfilling life and ultimately eternal life. But if we allow ourselves to get attached to the wrong things and especially the wrong person, which is why I'm so passionate about how we handle relationships, especially romantic relationships at this age, because I get see so many people getting attached to the wrong person. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It's just not the right person. They have a different calling. We get attached to the wrong person. It can sometimes change the course of our life dramatically. Which is why I'm so passionate about it. I'm so passionate about these things. So above all else, guard your heart for it determines the course of your life. And I think that's probably all I need to say. I think I've made every point I need to make. I think I said this quote last week. We're, discuss we're discovering our shape, who's God made us to be. And once you discover that over the course of these weeks and over the course of the rest of your life, don't waste who God has made you to be. You've got a wonderful gift. You are a wonderful gift. When you discover who you are, discover who God's made you to be. 
don't waste it. Use it for his glory.